Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about racial and ethnic inequality. So to get into the history of racial and ethnic relations, again, we have to delve into 400 years of history in the United States. And when we look at 400 years of history in the United States, you're going to see a lot of racism, ethnocentrism, sexism, heterosexism, different negative attitudes toward different groups, um, things that could be argued may have been genocide, you know, so we have a lot of questions we have to be asking when we actually look back on our history. Then we have to go and ask, at what point do we judge people? Again, you know, when they founded the Declaration of Independence, they had a chance to give rights to women and other groups, but instead white males maintained power and then denied other people the access to compete. And so... Do we go all the way back to the Founding Fathers and critique them for not giving liberty and justice for all? Or at what point do we start to kind of judge history? And, you know, from a sociological perspective, the goal is not necessarily to judge, but to observe pattern behaviors and its effects upon groups of people. And so at what point, again, do we define race and ethnicity, racism and ethnocentrism as social problem? And it's just the origin of anyism, an overarching social problem. So I put up a longer video that delves deep into the history of race and diversity and ethnicity and where some of the um, intolerance comes from and the origin of race. But usually I think about the origin of race as simply being economics as a huge core of it and then social inequality in that Europeans wanted to divide society into rich and poor and they wanted to make sure that they were the ones who had the elite social positions and other people could not compete. So Europeans came up with these ideas that we call modern races, which are white, black, Native American, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, uh, or Asian. And But it's us who came up with these categories in the first place. They don't actually exist in nature. So again, when we go to study race and ethnicity, we have to look at it from a biopsychosocial perspective. And then when we go to study racial inequality, same thing. We have to look at is inequality between groups due to biological factors or psychological factors or sociological factors? Or is it just oriented in 400 years of history in which one group was trying to suppress another group? So again, when we're looking at prejudice, discrimination, stigmatization, and violence, we have to look at this on an individual level, and we also have to look at this on an institutional level. So again, when we think about sociology, we're always talking about the study of society, groups of people, but that group of people, the groups of people, they consist of individuals. So again, it is individuals all contributing individually to that comprise all of society. So again, when we're gonna look at things like race and ethnic patterns, we have to look at it on both an individual and institutional level. So, but again, just some of the examples of the negative history in the United States, the, we had slavery, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act, which removed citizenship for all Asians, uh, the decimation of indigenous cultures and groups, um, prejudice and discrimination toward immigrants, and all immigrants at some point coming to America have had some form of prejudice and discrimination, whether they were Irish or Eastern European or Asian or Latino. And then in sociology, we're going to look at the correlates of prejudice and discrimination and stigmatization and violence. We're going to look at factors that are associated with these variables, okay? And then we're going to look at how these uh, multi-dimensional variables such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, disability status, and region are all intersectional. And again, your book describes that people that are the most pre prejudicial toward races and ethnicities tend to be white and living in the South, for example. We need a couple of key words here. We have racism, and then we have ethnocentrism. So the ism applied to race, racism, believing one race is superior to another, and ethnocentrism, judging one's culture based upon your own. And so throughout this chapter, that's what we're going to be discussing. We're going to be looking at the effects, the consequences of racism and ethnocentrism upon groups of people, and how they have been blocked from being able to rise up the social class ladder, blocked from these correlates of prejudice from the education system, from the job market, okay? So prejudice and discrimination. When we're thinking about the words prejudice, we're thinking about attitudes, such as stereotypes. And then with discrimination, we're gonna be looking at actions, okay? So again, they are not the same thing. Prejudice, I just think keyword attitudes, and for discrimination, I think keyword actions. 
Racism, again, is the belief that one race is superior to another, and ethnocentrism is the belief that one culture is superior to another, and you judge based upon your cultural standards. Race is supposed to be about biology, when we separate these categories out. And ethnicity is supposed to be about culture. So when we're talking about race, we're supposed to be looking at biological differences between groups of people. And when we're talking about ethnicity, we're looking at cultural differences between groups of people. But our racial categories that we have today, white, black, Asian, Native American, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, these are not based upon genetic differences between people. The Europeans that came up with these racial categories essentially did not have genetic testing and they didn't have awesome skills to be able to really delve into genes and figure out how they work. But again, what's interesting is that if you are white, you have less in common with your white next door neighbor than you do someone in Africa. And so when you actually delve into the genetics of race, it's ridiculously complex. And the medical community is screaming out, please stop thinking of yourselves as white, black, and Asian. It's totally messing up all the records. The psychologists are looking at race and ethnicity and saying, look at the effects it's having on psychological health and physical health also. And the sociologists are saying, look, our racial categories do not accurately group people according to biological traits. Racial categories were culturally constructed by groups in power for purposes of domination and subjugation. So again, race is supposed to be about biology and ethnicity is about culture, but again, races have no basis in biology. So you'll hear me talk about in a couple lectures this concept of, you know, is anyone actually white, black, Asian, or, you know, Native American? Is that really how race works? And the geneticists and scientists are like, no, that's not how it works. We're all pretty blended on this planet as it is too, just to further complicate things. So really races are just another form of ethnicity. You know, when, we, when you look at racial categories in the United States census, it's not based upon, you know, your genomes, it's based upon country of origin or, a, you know, a group, a culture that you identify, for example. And it's all very, very confusing. Um, someone from India, you know, are they Asian or are they Indian? Someone from Russia, are they Asian or are they white? I mean, Russia is, you know, in Asia. Is Europe even a continent? No. So Europeans are actually just Asians, you know, and so things get very, very complicated. And so I put up a couple lectures on some of this stuff just to go deeper. I just don't want to go too far off the book with this lecture. So just a quick summary of that. But the essential idea is that race is a cultural construction. It is us through social interaction that came up with this idea, this method of categorizing people according to these races that we came up with. But the problem is they're all completely inaccurate. However, the experience of race is incredibly real. And so that's kind of what we're talking about as the social problem is the experience of race and ethnicity, albeit we can debunk much of race and, et and ethnicity again is just a cultural grouping of people that have something in common but the chart here on the left for example just goes to show you how racial prejudice has infiltrated the minds of americans for example even on things like intelligence for example because we have all these negative stereotypes attached to intelligence again race has nothing at all whatsoever to do with intelligence what does is socioeconomic status. For example, when you take an IQ test of somebody who grew up in a really affluent neighborhood versus someone who grew up in a third world country, who does better on the IQ test? And it's not necessarily that the person who grew up rich, it's inherently biologically more intelligent than that person. It's just that they had food that day. The number one factor associated with intelligence is did you eat? Okay, and so someone who has food and is cared for and clothed and it goes to a good school that's challenging and really makes you work for it, that's the kind of stuff that's associated with intelligence. So is development associated with socioeconomic status? Yes, but race is not. Okay, race is a grouping of people that we made up ourselves that has no basis in biology that was created during a time when the science was not very good. So theories of racial and ethnic prejudice, discrimination, stigmatization, violence. Again, we have to take a biopsychosocial approach. Again, we have to ask the initial question, are people of different races actually biologically different? And the geneticists are saying, no, that's not how it works. We're all human. We all have unique differences. But this idea that all black people share common genes is a misnomer. Okay. 
And so you can trace that when it comes to like heart disease and things like that. There are people with genetic precursors for heart disease that are white, that are black, that are Asian. They might be a common race. There's people that share um, intolerance for dairy, okay, that um, which most of the world is, or they are race, except for the you know Europeans and the North Africans, they can drink milk. When we're looking at fingerprint tips, uh, fingerprints and malaria resistance, why people from Norway all the way to North Africa and in West Africa, all in East Africa, all have that same genetic resistance to malaria. So is that a race? Okay. So again, we have to really be questioning things. From a functionalist perspective, we're gonna say, what was the purpose of constructing a world, constructing a society in which race exists and ethnicities exist, okay? So race was created by Europeans so they could dominate society, divide into a class system and usurp the top positions. Ethnicity culture has tons of purposes for bonding purposes, for socialization purposes, etc. However, what benefits does prejudice and discrimination have toward other different groups you know who benefits from that so that's kind of functionalist conflict theory is looking at groups versus groups races were created uh so that one group could dominate the class system and remove competition conflict theory might also look at culture and say because of these ideology conflicts you know conflict results after that symbolic interaction is, is going to say that we're the ones who created this world in which racism and ethnocentrism and heterosexism and sexism exist. If we want, we could undo this society and create an entirely new society. Uh, the book talks about the socialization process. Where do you learn that you're white, black, or Asian? Again, children in nature don't just naturally come to the conclusion that they're white or black or Asian. They are socialized, they are taught this, and they are taught differently, for example. You know, when you go and ask white people, when did you find out you were white, it was usually like when they had to go check a box for the first time. But somebody who's black might find out they're, you know, black before somebody is find out they're white because they might have to. Like the Grey's Anatomy episode, when Dr. Bailey has to have a talk with her son and say, you know, son, you can't walk down the street with this plastic gun because of the color of your skin, for example. You know, and a white family doesn't have to have that conversation with their child at an early age, for example. Again, prejudice and discrimination. Disparities in you know, the way we live and our opportunities in life. So through the socialization process, your parents teach you, your peers teach you, the education system, the media. Children are just little sponges. We learn through stimulus and response. We learn through operant conditioning. We learn through social observation. Uh, just sitting back and thinking and watching and interpreting and coding all that information in your brain. So again, there's many ways that people learn about race and ethnicity and then prejudicial and discriminatory attitudes toward different people. And the book talks also again about social learning theory, how through social interaction, then we are symbolically communicating with other people and they're the ones teaching us all of that. But again, as we discussed, economics is a huge core of racism and ethnocentrism in the United States because one group is trying to dominate another group. And so a racist and ethnocentrist system, you know, enables the subjugation of groups of people. And then the scapegoat theory is also addressed by your book in that we blame other groups of people for the problems of society. So has racial and ethnic relations improved? Has access to the ability to rise up the social class ladder improved for groups of people? And again, we can point to many things like the Civil Rights Act, women's rights, uh, three waves of feminism, same-sex marriage, the overturning of Jim Crow laws. Um, but does prejudice and discrimination still exist? And the short answer is absolutely yes. It has gotten better. You know, in 1980, there were only 400,000 interracial marriages, and now there's 10 million. And, you know, are overt lynchings being held by the sheriff and the townspeople that are all white in modern times? You know, some of that has gotten better. And access to be able to get an education and jobs and things like that has absolutely improved. However, we still live in that same class system that was has been for hundreds of years suppressing minority groups. And albeit things have changed, you still see disparities such as income. You know, a white man's dollar, a woman makes 80 cents to a white man's dollar, a black woman makes 67 cents to a white man's dollar, 
you know, and so is your race associated with how much money you make? Is your sex associated with how much money you make? Absolutely. Is your race and your sex and your ethnicity associated with hiring practices? Who gets the call back for the job? Is it John or Muhammad? And again, are Americans being prejudicial towards certain names because of their ethnic you know, connotations that are attached to names? And absolutely, we go out and study this every 10 years and we'll take black sounding names and white sounding names and then we apply for jobs with those names and then we track the frequencies of the callbacks. And it, every, it's, it, every decade is the same. It's, you know, the John gets the call three times to every day Quan that's out there. And so again, even your name is associated with whether or not you get a call back for the job. Is the education system, you know, does it favor certain groups of people? Are minority schools as good as the schools that the dominant majority schools go to? And historically, the answer was heck no. I mean, if you went back and looked at white schools 100 years ago and black schools 100 years ago, you would see incredible disparities. However, has it gotten better? Yes, it's gotten better. However, is why is there an educational attainment disparity between whites and blacks? Whites graduate 40% of whites graduate and only 20% of African Americans graduate, why? And then 67% of Asians graduate, why? Why are there disparities between these groups, okay? So a lot of these disparities, again, is it biological reasons? Is it, you know, because one person's better at it than another? Are Asians really just biologically smarter? Is that why they're getting more college degrees? Or is it psychological factors like motivation and emotion? Or is it social factors like the culture, your value systems? You know, what accounts for the educational disparities? But again, Asians make more money than whites because of the educational attainment. But for hundreds of years, whites have controlled all the wealth in America. So even though Asians are making more money in modern times, resulting from educational attainment and being able to get that job prestige to be able to get that wealth, whites still dominate the majority of the wealth that exists, okay? Now, we have had drastic attitude changes toward group relations. Again, if I was a black man and it was 1950 and a white man was walking down the street, would I have been expected to go to the other side of the street? And if I didn't, would I have been killed? And, you know, the number one reason an African American, for example, was historically lynched was for being too uppity, for being confident. I mean, a black man walking down the street confidently would get them killed historically. So again, we have gotten past that phase, I hope. But again, we always kind of have drawbacks. Every, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, you start to see these race riots and they just continuously happen, okay? But yes, changes have happened. It has gotten better. However, we're still seeing the effects of racism and ethnocentrism in modern times. And again, it comes much from access, opportunity, disparities in healthcare, disparities in educational attainment, job prestige, wealth, you know, these are all factors in rising up the social class ladder. And if you look at the institutions of society, what race are they primarily? What sex are they primi primarily? What sexual orientation are they primarily? And are those factors associated with whether or not you can become the head of one of those high institutions, for example? So again, this chart here on the right is a prime example. If you look at the average income of whites versus non-whites, you're going to see major disparities. And again, you have to ask why. That Asians having a higher number than whites is you know, attributed to culture and value systems and educational attainment. But why are those numbers lower for African Americans and Latinos? Is it because somehow they're not getting access to the education to get access to the job prestige? Is it culture? Is it a history of racism? And so again, when we go to study these things, we have to be thinking about a bazillion variables to really account for disparities between groups. But that's the social problem that we're discussing right now. We're looking at inequality between groups and we're asking why does that exist? Are these natural inequalities that come just from a meritocracy, from you know the best and the brightest rising up, or are these institutional structures that keep people down, okay? So again, from these charts in the bottom one, you can see the uh, wealth gap between whites and non-whites. And again, that's pretty extreme. I mean, literally, just, just one giant blue bar and everybody else has almost nothing. But that's historically been how America has been. So again, much of the inequality in America is because of discrimination. So for generations, we did not allow other non-whites to be able to attain wealth, to be able to get you know, achieve status so that they could have a scribe status for their children, you know? I mean, again, a scribe status is that what you're born into. And in America, white people did everything they could to make sure that non-whites could not have capital, the ability to compete, 
you know, a scribe status that can be passed on from generation to generation. It's only in the last 50, 60 years that that has now become possible for a minority. And again, this has resulted in a giant wealth gap between races, which means that the majority of the wealth is still held in America by one race, which essentially gives them a lot of power over people, hence the concept of white privilege. Again, if I'm a white male, am I going to get discriminated against as much as a white female? Am I going to experience as much sexual violence as a white female? Am I going to make more money than a black female or a Latina female? You know, and is that because of psychological factors or is it because I'm, you know, you, uh, the experience of discrimination is different for a white male compared to other non-white males? I was reading an article the other day that was really delving into this and it was talking about the difference between like men and women and that yes, men are, you know, receive more prejudicial and discriminatory policies from the police than women, but black men receive eight times as much discrimination from the police as a white man. And so that's kind of the association between white privilege. There are more whites in America, the likelihood of a white person having drugs and guns in the car at a police stop is two times to every black or Latino, yet we pull over the blacks and Latinos eight times to every one. And so again, the white privilege concept is that when you go to try to get access, you know, how easy it is, is it for you to rise with the social class ladder? Are you being blocked out? I mean, there's classism, being blocked out because you were born poor, which is like the number one of all the isms that trumps, it's more extreme and more intense Maybe not than sexism. Sexism might win out. I mean, again, which one has the most negative effect on society? Sexism, classism, racism, ethnocentrism. I mean, even just starting to rank those based upon inequality. I mean, again, women, 10,000 years of inequality. But then classism is a pretty big one because, again, growing up in poverty is a huge deal. But again, a white male coming out of poverty has more access to social mobility than a black male because of the color of their skin and they're less likely to experience prejudice and discrimination. And so that's a huge disparity. And then if a black man knows that, how does that affect them psychologically? And does that account for the educational attainment disparities between groups, for example? And on and on and on. But that's, hopefully you guys are getting the picture that to be able to examine these kinds of phenomena, inequality between groups, we need to be thinking about bazillion variables from a biopsychosocial perspective. It's very complicated. So again, to explain racial and ethnic inequality, I just take a biopsychosocial approach, okay? It's, it's the body, it's the structure of the brain, the neuroscience of it all. How does that play into, you know, becoming the best and the brightest in society? How much of it's psychological factors, self-esteem, motivation, emotion, um, cognition, speed of cognition, and then how much of it's social factors, like your race, your ethnicity, your sex, your gender, when it comes to inequality? And again, we can just look at pay rates and look at these intersectional variables that show you that, you know, women make less than men, but a black woman makes less than a white woman. An Asian woman makes more than a white woman. Why? And so that's what we have to try to answer. Okay. And so is, you know, educational attainment for Asians being higher than whites and non and, and blacks and Latinos, for example, is that because Asians truly are biologically smarter? Or is it because they grow up in a culture that is challenging them more, pushing them more than it is for other groups of people? You know, or is it because of access, you know, and racism and being blocked out? You know, what is it? And so that's kind of the goal is to be able to think about all these the multi-dynamic factors that could be associated with disparities between the groups. And hopefully you can see it's incredibly complicated. So again, reducing racial and ethnic inequality. We have been doing this successfully for a long time. Slowly over time, we fought against racism. We fought against women being blocked out from society. We fought to have Asians be allowed again to be American citizens. We're fighting to enable people from Latin America to be able to come to America and improve their lives as our open doors should be allowing, if only to increase our gross domestic product for the economy. So all of that has improved over time. However, we're still seeing inequality that exists. So do we need affirmative action? Absolutely. There was a great article done by uh, some Harvard Asian students the other day that was just like a pro-affirmative action argument and reasons for why. And it was really an excellent argument. And we needed affirmative action initially to be able to bring some groups up so they at least had a chance to compete. 
But however, since racism and ethnocentrism still exist, we still need to make sure that people are not being completely blocked out. And all that really means is, get them a good education. Let them have a fair interview for a job. Let people make it on their own, okay? Racial democracy, again, recognizing that racial injustice exists and that we should be addressing that. And then, you know, getting equitable access to institutions. Why are the kids from the really good neighborhoods going to way better schools than the kids growing up in the poor neighborhoods? And then how is your race or your ethnicity associated with where you're located in the social class system, which then is associated with what type of educational system that you get to go and learn from, for example. Uh, also recognizing that race is a cultural construct, that it doesn't validly, accurately group people together according to biological differences. So one really easy way to end racism is just to stop thinking of yourself as white, black, or Asian. Just think about yourself as a human and a person. You can also change the meanings attached to races, ethnicities. Deconstruct the negative stereotypes, you know. There's multiculturalist attitudes. There's diversity attitudes. And so there's many ways to make it better. But really, it just requires major attitude shifts, changing hearts and minds, and then changing the structures that block people from accessing society and the social class ladder. Okay, so obviously there's a lot to talk about, a lot of variables going on, but thank you so much.